We were busy doing the detailing on the fillets, and we had installed a saddle, trimmed it all, well, not really totally trimmed it up, but just got it roughly trimmed. And on this tape, what we're going to try to do is cover all the all of the aeropoxy light application, finishing, detailing, whatever we can. It's relative to doing the fillets on the wood fuselage. And of course, most of that we want to use again, use the same or very similar material application right to the carbon fiber one. Again, we're trying to improvise a lot of these things as we go along, so hope you can join us for the ride. Now in today's mail, this came from Milk Graham out in California, and he knows that I love model railroading. And he sent me, and we'll go through these real quick, just get them on the video. See, the nice thing about having them on a video, almost everybody I know of that likes modeling, likes all modeling. I like myself, boats, RC, helicopters, you name it, I like it. And model railroading, everybody knows I'm trying to get time to build this O-Gage Railroad. <laughs> you know what, the business is so busy with these composite parts and developing stuff, it's just, I don't even dream about it anymore. Anyway, look at this, I guess somebody had my stuff out there, somebody's trying to, uh, pretty good, milk. <laughs> oh man, look at this, now tell me, see, in the middle of something you don't even know you're going to find an inspirational photo. People are always looking for a cool paint job. Absolutely cool. Hang glider. Anytime you want to find a funny story, totally true. Ask Ski Dombrowski about being towed down the beach by his wife on one of these and she forgot to release him when he crashed and dragged him down a beach two million feet. Anyway, I always like to look at what's going on in other parts of the country, get ideas. There's always cool ideas for paint jobs. There's a, oh, look, as I say it, look what comes up. Look at the lettering on this. Kind of wall prey lettering, multi-tone. And if you think the only pretty planes are in the world of stunt, forget it. Oh, now look, here, exactly CST, the company I've been dealing with. Gail, maybe that's, no, that's probably your husband. All of the product, very similar, and please check them out on the website. Now, Midgley is one of the ones I really have a lot of respect for. He never misses a chance to look for cool paint jobs, paint schemes. This looks like the head, this looks almost like the Ram Show. Nice, well, I assume that's some kind of a tiger cat type plane. A nice pipe. And again, Milt, I really appreciate that you're sharing this with us because obviously there's no way I would get a chance to go out to California. On my budget, I'm lucky I can make it up to the hot tub at the end of the night. Now this looks like a good place, like for a John Brodak exposition. Now look, talk about nice paint jobs. Oh man, look at this one. See, now I always hear from people say, oh, it's RC, oh. Huh. Yeah, baloney, you build this. Let me tell you something, pal. You build this plane right here, RC or control line. My hat is off to you. You try make molding all these canopies and making these nacelles and exhaust. Forget about it. The world of modeling includes model railroads. It includes, actually, it includes art. What we really do, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as I can tell, I don't have some unique opinion here. We are artists in our own right. And you go up to that Spitfire bedroom, and I, you know, I don't know what to describe it as. Look at this, oh man. Ken Clapson, eat your heart out. Kind of a tsunami pylon racer look. A little modeling class I guess they're having here. See, there's a whole world outside of the world we circulate in, the little orbits we make. And what I've learned is you can always learn from other people. Every time I go to the Ram show or one of the modeling shows, I come back all flipping out and ready to go build something. Beautiful stuff. The whole world is full of beautiful stuff. 
you just got to realize and, and realize that it's not only control line stunt. All these events, they demand your respect. There's a lot of work goes into these airplanes. I also got some construction photos from Milt Graham, and this is his Joker. Now, one of the things Milt mentioned in a letter, and, and I really appreciate that he shares this stuff with us, one of the things he mentioned is he's been making a comeback, and he's trying to blast off all the rust after years of building. I'm going to assume that's a a removable tailwheel. Some of the nose construction. Now Milt's been checking out a lot of videos and he's, as far as I can tell, picking up useful information. Looks like he's got an old Tiger 51 in this guy. Now this is nice. Now see, here's, here's the thing you can pick up off of somebody's photos. Or they, look how nice he's pre-tapered the crutch. Or the mounts, I shouldn't say crutch, it looks like there's some kind of a, uh, a I can't even tell from that, but it's, we'll find out how that's going to work, because Milt checks in regularly with photos, hey, and I appreciate it. Cow block. I can't tell from this just how the crutch begins or ends. I assume that's the tank shim on there. It looks like some beefy bulkhead, or maybe this is radial mounts, and I don't even realize it. I'd need to see the plans for this. The name of this plane is the Joker. Plastic fuel tank. Now it was real was real nice of Milt to mention that he's been watching some videos and he picked up some good information off him. But let me tell you, part of part of all the video stuff we do, and I include Paul Winter and everybody else in on it, is sharing it. A lot of people, you know, they want it to be a one-way street. Well, hey, if I can see what you're doing, you know, in this case, boy, and Milt cut his own foam wings and they look, Milt, you can cut me a set of cardinal wings anytime you want. <laughs> Now this looks like the front part of, I'm just going to assert, I can't tell. See, because I'm not familiar with the Joker. Okay, here it shows the, the, the this is what I want to see. Now see, this is what, this is what it's really helpful to have. Okay, this is the mounts, I assume, are headed up into here. And this is hollow, and I see he's got it screwed in. I need to see that from the other side. Laminating the doublers on. Oh, this is his own design, okay. Okay, here, now we're getting back to it. Here's the nose construction. And I always like to look at how other people do things, you know? People think there's only one way to do something. Now, it's a handicap. There's another picture of that crutch, and it certainly is, especially now that I'm working. See, I would like to know from Milt, if he's ever got time to wait, what does this piece weigh? Because we know my crutch, the carbon one, weighs 43 grams. Without the tank shim, maybe 50 with the tank shim. Well, this would be interesting to see if you made this exact piece out of carbon, because you can mold this all in one piece. You can have the grain running. Here's some more pictures of the alignment. Now, this is something even I hadn't thought of, but we're going to have to be doing this real soon. See these clamps? I've seen these in Home Depot. Now, I have to come up with some kind of clamping thing when I put the formers in the carbon fuselage. So. I've already got something off of these pictures that's that's to me not only worthwhile, it's it's extremely worthwhile. And you know the the thing is not everybody builds planes exactly alike. And there's a lot of room for, you know, doing your own thing, and that's I guess what's beautiful about the hobby. If we were all building exactly the same planes, well, I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't want to be going to a Nats where everybody's playing, even if they were all Cardinals, or if they were all whatever. I think it's nicer when they're all different. Here's just what I was talking about. Obviously, this looks like Saran Wrap. It could be Teflon sheeting. Uh, by the way, Gerald Champ wanted to try some of that. I'm in the process of getting it for him right now. Some of this Teflon sheeting, or if you can't get any wax paper or Saran Wrap, now you can build right over the top which looks like exactly, I'm just guessing, what Milt has done here. 
can make the whole thing. I assume under here is soft building board or something that you can stick pins in. He's got both sides sheeted. Again, we're going to be doing real soon, probably the next tape, in fact, or one of the next ones is going to be making a tail, and I'm going to use pretty much, well, uh, I've got it in my mind so far, how I want to do the leading edge and a mold and some, some of the take-apart features. See, the reason I've left the tail go to last is because I haven't figured out exactly. It's going to be a flat tail like the Sweeper or Kazi or Paul or any number of people. I think even Frank McMillan's got a flat tail on his plane. Now, that's kind of accepted technology. But you can always learn from other people's stuff. You can always get ideas. It's ideas that are hard to get. Now again, it looks like these are wing photos. This looks like it's part of the controls. Joining the wing halves. I can't tell with a bolt hole, a bolt head coming up, I'm not sure glass in the center of the wing and that's one way of doing it one of the ways we've done in the past with the ellipses seems to work totally bulletproof that little piece of plywood on top of the wing certainly isn't going to hurt anything as far as stiffening up the wing either the cutout for the belt crank another good idea to plywood reinforcements around the edge Now here's something I noticed. He sheets his wings with the grain parallel to the trailing edge. I sheet mine parallel to the leading edge. And believe me, none of this matters if the wing comes out straight, light, and true. Okay. Now this is something that's real handy, and I have to pick one up myself. I gotta get another one, because I got one tied up with my gear mold. Little machinist vices and my wire bender. Both of those are down at the other shop. Here's the completed wing. Looks like the wing tips are already installed. Looks like what Milt's got is a, a tip weight box cover on the outer tip. Tips before he's doing, this is similar to what I did and I think, I'm not sure who in, Lou Dudke used to do it that way. I'm sure many, I, I think Paul Walker does it that way too. Okay, and I, I have to tell you, I like this. Chow, right in, right in his shop. When I get wealthy, I'm going to get my own coffee maker right in his shop. Anyway, this looks like the final product. Now I wonder if this is some kind of wood filler. Maybe next time I talk to Milt, I'll ask him about that filler. Maybe we can always find new products, that's for sure. Aluminum landing gear. I like these. This is one of the nicer this is better than the sore I have. I have the, the junk one. Now this is one of the things Jim Greenaway was always a big believer in. Of a lot of side area up in the front of the plane. My F-16 had a giant canopy like that. Flew very well. I'll be very interested to see how this flies, Milt, when you get it all. And what's nice is yeah, Milt had a special note that he watched the tape on fiberglassing. He was afraid to fiberglass it, and the job came out per... Oh, look, he's got the tape right here, glassing, 150. Yeah, fiberglassing, if somebody walks you through it even once, nothing to be afraid of. There's more of the construction pictures. And boy, you know, if you watch, even if you looked at a hundred pictures and only picked up one good idea, or two, you're one good idea ahead of having no good ideas. I really look forward to seeing this guy when he's all finished and painted and some idea of how he flies.
the tips, and the filler. I like to know what, what brand of filler that is. I'm always looking for new products. And obviously Milt is one of these meticulous guys with micrometers and things to measure and check and all of that stuff. Is that machinist fight? That is a handy tool, believe me. Anyway, Milt, Milt, we really appreciate. I love the last photo in this set too. That is, there's a lot of things I take as a real compliment in life, and I'm always happy to help people, of course. But this is this is probably one of the nicest compliments I've ever gotten. Look, he's got the plane surrounded with windy videos. Anyway, and he said they were very helpful. Anyway, Milt. And he's got a couple of them where they're in either primer or silver. And boy, it looks like auto primer to me. Anyway, again, Milt, I really appreciate it. And we love looking at your shop. I hope you also are getting some good, good tips off the video. I hope you'll be sending some of these down over to, to Tom Morris. And what we need here is a picture of the complete. I don't see any of the completed plane. Anyway, it looks like the next set of pictures we get, it'll be painted. Well, thanks a whole lot. We're going down to make some aero epoxy fillets. You can see what I've been doing is leveling this off, evening this off. We roughed these in on the last video. Evening this off, I want to get this even here. Take the rest of it out with my little wizard tool. And then I want to even this up so this is exactly the same thickness front to back. That whole saddle and I'll do that with a piece of tape. This is where that little wizard tool is real handy. Getting all these little nooks and crannies. As soon as I break this piece away, what I'll do is I'll get in there with a, a sanding stick and get that nice and even in there. Again, I want to maintain that very slight angle in this saddle. There's a very slight angle. You couldn't just lay one piece of plywood in here. You want it to get as, well, I want it to get as close to the wing as possible. This is one area we're having this, the roll of sandpaper. I can get right in there. I hardened up the plywood with thin CA. This makes a great sanding block, by the way. Radiused all this off. In about another five minutes, I'll be ready to true the outside edge. But I want to make sure there's no sharp spots at all, because they're going to poke a hole in the paint, if nothing else. And I got this little guy here. He's good for getting in all the corners and edges. Now I was thinking there's a lot of ways in the past that I've done fillets with all kind of spoons and trowels and prop blades and everything. What I want to try this time, I got some marbles. I think it was in Stunt News I saw that little tip, and I've heard about doing that, but I've never tried it. So we'll give the old marble technique a try. It's handy because we're sanding a joint that's plywood to plywood. So sandpaper can, it can just be difficult to get in a nice radius. The port of cable does a real nice job. You have that little point you can work with.
Now the other area where I'm really trying to pay real attention up here is where that radius comes in. And what I'm going to have to do is make up a little, see, this is one of the things you can do with sandpaper that I like. You can squeeze it so it's almost the right radius. Oh, it's exactly the right radius. Because that's going to be the a vulnerable part if I don't get that nice and solid. Now before I finish with all of the sanding on the inside, I'll go do a test fit and make sure I don't have a, a little sharp spot that's impressing, that's putting a little ding down in the wing. Thing I want to see if I want to lay this out with, I have some eighth inch tape, some quarter inch tape. I think quarter inch will be an appropriate choice, but of course we can always change it. We can always make it a quarter and an eighth. And this is going to set my, remember this is on an angle. The thing to always remember here is, yeah, quarter inch tape is going to do it. Uh, let's go quarter and a little bit more. Quarter and a sixteenth looks like what it's going to be. Now, if you really were fussy, you could lay out. I just don't happen to have any sixteenth tape handy. And now I can take and just dremel off this extra little piece so that I have a quarter inch base on the saddle. I decided rather than make the fillet bigger, I'm going to get it quarter inch right up against the glue joint. He used the tape as a reference line. There's a lot of ways of using tape that they just come in handier and handier as you learn different ways to use it. And obviously when I'm finished, I'll dress that all off with a sanding block, get it nice and smooth. Get all the extra work off of it, all the heavy duty stuff, the final little bit I can just screw in with a sanding block. Remember, I originally started this thinking I'm going to need two layers of 64, so if this gets real thin, what I thought about doing is putting half, in, half ounce glass inside. If it starts getting to uh, when I do the sanding operation, Now, once that's smooth, of course, you can just pull up the tape. It's nice when you have fingernails. Anyways, if we didn't have enough snow lately, we're predicting snow tomorrow, too. Come on! I'm definitely moving to Anaheim. This is crazy with all this snow. I spent half my life shoveling snow. I could just dress that off. Before I lay this out for the aero epoxy, I want to make sure that I have a relatively scuffed up surface. Remember, epoxy always sticks to a scuffed up surface a whole lot better than to a shiny surface. So I have some 220 wrapped on one of the old trowels. I'm not really trying to make that that nice and smooth. What I'm trying to do is get a scuffing into the fiberglass. Again, it's not going to be pretty when we make it. I don't care about if it's pretty. What I want is when it's all done that I get good adhesion. I'm much more concerned with the adhesion right now than anything else. By the way, what's surprising is this little has really added some strength. Now, that's another thing I did not anticipate was that this fillet in a, a normal construction plane doesn't really add a whole lot. Some, but certainly not night and day. But on this, it's a significant gain. 
But I'm still not happy. I still think we need another bolt up here. I'm thinking about that lately. I keep thinking two bolts, one gets loose, wing comes out. And you know when it'll happen. You know, you know the reality here is it's going to happen when you're at the Nats, right on an official flight. So I've been thinking about that. I need to make the bulkhead on the wing bigger or that's just something I need to be thinking about in the next, well, next couple days, next week or so. Again, I'll get all of the little high spots off of here. Except you don't want to leave out after all that sanding is to take some M600, get any fingerprints or grease or anything off of it. And we're going to lay out the tape once this dries. Now what I'll do, I'll make a mirror image. You know, this is exactly a quarter of an inch. Put a piece of tape a quarter of an inch up. Put a second piece around it and pull out the first piece. And we got a couple little things we've learned about using aeropoxy light over the last, I don't know, four or five models. And we'll try to include all of them, of course. Now again, we'll try to use the same tape that we used for the outside so that we have kind of a symmetrical fillet. The first piece is going to get pulled away. So we'd like to get that right up on the glue seam if possible. And this is one of the areas where, if possible, you'd like to keep your grease off your hands or whatever. Okay, now that's the first piece of tape that goes on there. Now what I like to do is, from this port on, just use a piece of eighth inch tape. Lay that in position. And then when I pull up that first piece, Since it's the same roll of tape I used, ah, oh, you dog! Look at that. And this is not critical. Like you don't need a micrometer to do this. But it's nice now. You know you have a 90 degree angle, the same amount on one side as the other, at least to start with. Using this as my border, now I can just take some thicker tape, let me get right up in here, and you can do this any number of ways, just like masking off a plane. Now one of the things we learned about aeropoxy early on is it's made to go off at 72 degrees. So if your shop conditions like mine are, mine is about 58, well it gives you more working time but the material tends to be a little thicker and harder to apply. So what I try to do is before I'm going to do a fillet like this, put the material up by a heating vent, let it warm up a little, get it up to about 72 degrees. If this were a plane where the wing was installed, we'd want to lay an, a piece of tape out on both sides. So we have tape roughly a quarter of an inch from the glue seam on both sides. And we'll do this side off camera. I masked off the wing the same way. Of course, here we have two sides to mask off, quarter inch on each side, because when we're done, we want, we'd like them to match anyway. The idea here is you'd like to have all the masking done, and once you mix the aeropoxy, you want to get the job done. You don't want to fool around, fool around, waiting for it. This is just more typical of what an average no-take-apart plane would be like. 
So we actually, in this, in the course of this demonstration, have a chance to do it both ways. I rough this up a little bit. And the only reason for the tape is so that if you smear some on the outside of it, you know, you don't have to worry about it really. Just a little safety precaution. Now here's where it's going to get a little tricky because up by this fillet. I'm not so sure I know how that's going to lay out. And again, we're going to run out of fillet right here. This is going to have to require a little, a little bit of finesse. In fact, the way this looks, this is not going to lay out the way I'd like. Maybe an easier way. I'm going to have to improvise here because this area here is not really a quarter of an inch and up here it's not exactly a quarter so let's see if we can do something like this Welcome. we're going to have to kind of fake it in there because that's where the, the bottom cowl is going to attach I'll mask the other side the same and then we're ready to mix Aeropoxy Light. Aeropoxy comes in two little tubes. Now, obviously you can figure this out. It's a two to one by weight mix. You need to do this accurately with a gram scale if you have to. Read the directions. Very blunt, very poignant, clear. Before I do anything, Aeropoxy, both mixes tend to settle out if you let them sit, especially if you let them sit for a long amount of time. But get a good stirring of the ingredients in. Try not to introduce a lot of air. An Allen wrench, by the way, is a good thing to stir it with. Before I do anything, I want to get a piece of cardboard. Now, what I'll do is go to the grain scale, weigh the cardboard. Then weigh up how many grams it is, write it down. Mix twice the amount by weight. Again, it's not by volume. It's by weight. So one, one amount, two amount. doesn't matter. If this is seven, make this 14. I carefully weighed, and this, this piece of cardboard is seven grams. So I want to take, and it isn't, there's enough to do many planes. You don't, you don't need a lot of this, that's for sure. Now I want to get the accurate weight and deduct seven. Now if you didn't have a gram scale you could probably do it by uh, making a piece of balsa wood twice as long on this side as on that side and putting a razor blade in between and make let it balance like a seesaw. Sounds pretty rocket scientist, huh? Okay, so we have eight here. So now we need four of this. Tip number two. See, a lot of people do this. They mix with this and then put this one in here. Mm -mm. Start with a different mixer. This part tends to sink out too in time. And like with all epoxies, you want to stir it, get it homogenized. This is the part where if you have a problem, this is always what the problem is, is it either wasn't stirred, mixed incorrectly, or you did it when the room was too cold. If you try to use this at 40 degrees, it doesn't mix well. You just don't get a good bond. Okay, now, I know, for instance, right now, I want to add four to this amount. So I can just put this over, and now as soon as I can make the scale ride up, See, I'm being careful not to get this mixed. Don't 
We won't mention who the one person in the world was. I got a little bit too much. Just put a little bit back. Who, who mixed two parts of the small one, the one part of... I won't mention his name. The initials are RG, though. <laughs> Tip. See, there's still a lot of hardener on here. Before you stir it up, because we know that's an accurate mix now. See, I'd like it not to be, and I can wipe this off too, this Allen wrench that I used. But, but now I'm not contaminating it with a wrench that already has material on it. So I can get this off the scale. Now the mixing part. There's a mixing, there's a rule in all epoxy. You mix it, and when you think it's mixed, and it's all the same color, you look at your watch and mix it for two minutes more. In this case, that's mandatory, because we're in a relatively cool environment. This is kind of thick. So when we mix it, you notice it gets thinner and thinner and more liquidy. And yet it's still thixotropic. It'll still hang upside down without falling off. That's called thixotropic. So no matter where we put this and what shape we make it, it's not going to run, it's not going to drip, it's not going to drool. And keep in mind, this is not a product that's made for hobbyists. It's made for people that are building real airplanes. It's made to a very high quality control, but you can certainly ruin all the quality control in the world if you go and mix it three to one, or if you don't stir it, or any number of things that, that you can do to... Everybody has a way they can invent something. Okay, I'm going to shut the camera off and just mix this for two more minutes. You don't want to watch this for the next two minutes, but right now that's mixed. Right now that needs two more minutes of mixing. Hell, I used this, this AHM prop the last time we did fillets. Look, it's still, still got the air epoxy on it. Anyway, a prop like this is a spoon is good. Any, any tool like this is handy. You just want to get some of them. There's, there's any number of ways of doing this. Now, a lot of people leave it this way, this, that this is their fillet shape. Nothing wrong with that. I want to try that marble technique. Now, what happens if you hold the prop at a 90-degree angle or if you hold it this way, you're going to get two different diameters of fillet. And I know I have to cheat a little bit up here, so maybe that's what I want to ultimately do. No, I really don't even have to. It's going to leave a little bit less than what I expect. In fact, it's leaving a little bit less than a quarter of an inch, which is just fine. Needless to say, it's nice if you if you just happen to have clean hands, or if you don't like getting this on your hands, you can always wear a set of rubber gloves. Okay, now what I wanted to try, next thing is I want to get a little trowel. Let me get another piece of paper here. And just carefully remove, and lay this down here. Remove anything that goes up to the edge of the tape, just as a way of keeping the working area relatively neat. This is one of those real handy times if you have like your modeling friend and he can come over and hold it and this is this is a real handy time to have that that helper that uh, same thing we want to do up here and we've got pretty much all of this off now, a lot of people wipe their finger in alcohol, or I just hit that with the trowel, of all things. But now, now that I've done that, I can clean off all the material on this. Now, I can hold it at one angle for the whole time. And I'll get even more material off, you'll see. See, I, I didn't hold it right up here. So. 
this is besides the point up here because we don't know what that shape is going to ultimately look like and it sands so easy it's not like it's not like even if you didn't do this the right way it would be a big deal stuff sands almost exactly like balsa wood does there you get it in one swipe you want to be cute and that's all but now what I wanted to try again was at my mother's house today she gave me a bag of marbles and my wife gave me some bath bubbles she said look if it doesn't work out we'll use them in a hot tub so I want to see what marble diameter this is this is oh there's all different diameters in here let's try a blue one this is supposed to be a good trick uh, this is too big not really okay blue one doesn't work oh we got a green one we got one that's a little bit smaller in diameter let's see if this deal works uh, it left it a little bit rough up there I think we're gonna have to hold out the jury on this let's see if we have any other small ones no, it's the only one. Okay, but now, even if you're not happy with that fillet, no big deal. You can go right back in. Just remember that as you change the angle, the fillet diameter will change. And you can get rid of the extra material. And once I pull up the tape, As you pull the last pieces of tape up, you should have something like a reasonably nice fillet. Now, I don't go crazy because it sands very easily, but if you wanted to, you could run around and pick away at it. I think right there, that's all you need to do. Any little uneven or rough spot, when that's dry, it'll sand right out. All right, I'm going to do the other one off camera, and then we'll do real quickly, we'll do the, the fuselage part of this, and put it aside 48 hours to dry. See, this can happen from time to time. You see the little bubble right there? As you have hot air in the house here, and it warms up, I see a little bubble, and there's no problem. What that is is an air bubble. I could just run the prop with a trowel back over this, well, I look for, that's the only one. Oh, here's another one. And what it is, you've put in, you've trapped, just like you do in any epoxy work, you've trapped a little air bubble in there. But you want to get rid of all the air bubbles. And then just go back over that with the trowel. Or the, in this case, I'm having better luck with the prop blade, for sure, than with the, uh, with the marble. You break that air bubble down, just clean off all the all the material. Now a lot of times you need to add a little material. In this case, that was a relatively big one. Now because we don't have tape on the edge, we'll just can clean this off. Let's see if we got rid of all the air. That's probably the worst situation you can have. And even if even if it dried that way, you could, you know, dig it out, chop it out. Usually you get air when you mix too fast, and probably that's what I've been guilty of here. Now if I take this, clean it off. Take my little trowel and just scoop the little overage that came off. It's all going to get re-sanded anyway, and this material does sand quite nice. Now, see, I saw that before I actually removed this tape, so don't even have to bother with the top. One thing always seems to help with with this material in particular is once you get the fillet made. 
get it up by a heating vent. The heat seems to let it cure a lot better than if you just let it sit in a cold cellar. And if it starts to kick off, obviously just junk it and mix up another batch. Actually, I mixed about three times the amount I needed here. Anyway, this is a whole, not a whole lot different than doing on the bottom. I'm not going to belabor this, but now there's our fillet. Actually, we got this one in one stroke of the propeller. Now, if I want to, I can hold the prop at a little bit, a little bit more acute angle. The thing is not to go too fast. When you go too fast, that's when it seems like you pick up the air. I'll have to perfect my marble technique. Anyway, I thought that would work. But this way is so bulletproof. Okay, I'll pull the rest of the tape off. Put this aside to dry 48 hours before we work on this again. Now one of the one of the things I try to do is get this in a warm area. I put it by a heating vent. It's been up there for two days. Usually you can tell by looking at the the air epoxy will dry relatively smooth, but it's the problem is it's too smooth. The only reason you have to sand it is to get a tooth. If you would have just put primer or paint over that, well, it's kind of it's not a good idea because it's such a smooth, shiny surface. You don't get a good a good tooth. So what I'm going to do is get my little sanding tools out, and this is where the little polywogs come in. And I'll do this one first, and then I can put on a little bit of primer on this one, and while this one is drying, I can work on the other one. See, that's the nice thing about Brodak primer. It'll dry in about an hour. So by the time I sand one out, the other one will be ready. It just really makes doing this kind of work just a snap instead of waiting overnight for everything. I found, I found a great way that, that works for me, seems to work for me, is I take Brodac primer and I mix it 50-50 with retarder. That mix of 50-50 retarder, this is straight retarder. This is not something you want to paint the plane with. But for going over air epoxy, and you can go over with a brush because you're going to sand it anyway. There's no real reason to spray it unless it's just convenient for you to spray it. So if I make up a mixture of 50-50 of this, I only need a two or three ounces of it. I'll make a little mixture of it up and that'll be my material once I'm done sanding. The next thing is to set up the sanding tools. And I always make it easy. There's no point fooling around. A dowel will do. If, not, if you don't have any of these rubber things, you can always use a dowel. It's the right diameter. And what you do to get a grip on it, take some sticky back sandpaper, get the front even. And let the sticky back stick to itself. Now that makes a reasonable tool. That's usable. There's a lot better ones. Of course, these come with that Porter Cable tool, and they've got all kinds of shapes here. But I like to find one that's just a hair under the diameter. Now this one, of course, is on the big side. That one's even bigger. We'll find one here that's just a little bit less than the diameter. This usually is the one that works. Look around. If I don't have one, what I'll do is I'll run this on a sanding belt until I make one. But I want to have one so that the, the radius of the fillet is just a little bit less. Just to give you an example, let's just pretend this is overdone by a certain amount. The reason I want a little bit less diameter, you see what's got to happen is I've got to get the blend in this. I've got to eventually sand some of this. Now what happens if I use something this with this diameter, here's what happens, is I wind up making ditches. And I think this is one of the things, several people have done this, especially around a tail area, and the worst of all things, on a foam wing, because right here, if you were to look at the sheeting, what happens is you have a weak point in the sheeting, right where you don't want it, right where the fuselage is rigid, and right there you can, you can basically ruin an airplane. So the thought is, my thought always is, 
Use something just a little bit less diameter. Start in the middle of the fillet and then work your way up. But never start with a sanding tool. And the worst, absolutely the worst thing you could ever do is take like your thumb or who did I see doing this the other day? Somebody's sanding a fillet like this with their hand. Well, that guarantees you're going to weaken the fuselage side. And if it's a foam wing or if it's a, sh doesn't matter. There's always something here. And even on an I-beam wing, you don't want to weaken this. You don't want to weaken that little lip that goes out there. So to start with is always have something just a tad smaller to do the, the sanding and shaping with. That's the, good t the best tip I can think of for any fillets. What happens when air epoxy light dries, it usually will have a very high gloss smooth surface, especially if you've wiped it down with your finger, a prop, a marble, the round object of your choice. This shiny surface needs to get sanded. Now the reason for sanding is not really to change the shape. I, I'm real happy with the shape. One or two coats of primer on that, the shape will be fine. But it's the tooth. I call this a tooth. I'm sure anybody that's worked with, with any uh, chemical materials, what this does, it allows the surface of the primer or the filler or the dope or whatever, even if you're going to use auto primer, to get a tooth. And you wind up with this. It's called a mechanical tooth. It also allows these little areas to get little areas where the, th the thinner, in our case, the retorter, can penetrate and this is the most important because this gives you the chemical bond so you not only have a, a physical bond of teeth you also have little areas you've increased the surface area in other words if you have two flat surfaces you have a surface area that's very low if you have two surfaces like this well it's like a pleated air filter what you've done in effect is increase the surface area by about a power of, well, a big number anyway. So what we're looking for before we put any primer on our fillets is a tooth area. Just pretend something. We don't even have to pretend we probably will eventually have to do this. Here you go. Whoop, you have a little bit of an imperfection in that air epoxy light in the fillet. Well, you put your fingernail in it or you didn't trowel it out right. You've got this little crater. Well, you want to fill this in. If it's real small, you can just fill it in with the Brodac primer, and it'll be no problem at all. But in some cases, it's, it's just a little bit too much. So what you really want to do in that case is take a little more air epoxy, mix it up, and just trowel right over this area with a paper-thin layer. So in, in essence, you have a thin layer over the whole repair area that's attached to this. And then, of course, when you go back and sand it, that should totally disappear. A lot of people, maybe even building a semi-scale plane or for some reason around a cheek cal, say, or some unique area, which we, well, I don't think we have on this plane, but people want to know this. This is the kind of information it took me a long time to dig out. They want to make a big giant fillet. Let's say around a, or even if you're making a mold and you want to mold this around a cheek cowl or whatever. One of the things you might want to do, you have a fillet like this, and you get all done and you say, gee, the fillet's too small, I'd like it to be a little bit bigger. Well, there's, there's no reason you can't just add another layer and make it larger. But before you do that, you want to put those teeth. And the company that makes air epoxy recommends 80 grit paper when you're going to do an epoxy to an epoxy lamination. What they recommend is waiting 48 hours for the first coat to dry, so that this, in essence, is totally dry. See, with epoxy, you have two choices. The choice one is if it's still pliable and soft and, and like peanut butter, and it hasn't dried yet, you could trowel the next coat right on, and it does this on a molecular level, so you get a good bond. But once it skins over and dries, it has a hard skin, and you have to break that skin and they recommend 80 grit paper, I think, is a little severe for our application, since these models, there aren't many things you need 80 grit paper on. I like to use the yeah, like 220 or something, but to get that tooth. So that the next layer comes in, and it gets that tooth. Well, 
After that dries 48 hours, which in our case it's not a problem, you'll notice a lot of times people try to sand it out the next day. Yeah, you can do that. It just gets, it's a little soft the next day. It reaches its peak hardness at about 48 hours if you, if you go by the technical bulletins. But anyway, you could always add that. And in essence, you could add, if you waited, you could tooth this. And you wanted to add the third layer. But the minute you add a layer and don't tooth it, you run that risk. Or on a repair, if you have a, a little spot to fill in, you want to get in there and roughen that up before you pack that with material. If that little area, you want to somehow get in there with a, even with the tip of an XL blade or something and roughen it up. What you want is a rough surface before you fill that, or if even in the best world, you just skin over it and fill it at the same time. Then it totally disappears. So these are things that I hope, I hope will make for much better filleting. And in our case, we want to roughen that last area up for the Brodac primer. And when we get a couple of coats of primer, we're going to want to roughen the primer up. You want to roughen each coat up. Wherever there's going to be a pull, there's going to be a pulling action here. The minute you put a coat on that you haven't sanded and roughened it up a little bit, gets it gets risky. Now this is raw from the previous day. It hasn't been sanded at all, so I have one that's a little bit smaller. Some I think this is 240, but I'm not sure. But it's sticky back. Yeah, it's 240. But anyway, what I try to do is work the middle of the fillet first. I don't want to go out onto the raw wood. And this is part of it. You can see how long, I want to show how long it takes to do the mechanical tooth. You don't need to sit and sand for hours and hours and hours and hours. We just want to get, break that shiny surface. Work in the middle of the fillet. Now I'm not trying to, not trying to do that final blend. Now you can see, when aeropoxy is totally cured, it turns to powder. It doesn't turn to chewing gum. Some materials in the past that I've used, you may as well feel like you're sanding a piece of chewing gum or an old tire, a snow tire or something. This material just sands really. I'm gonna do the whole sand out on tape because I don't want people to think that like it should take five hours to do this relatively relatively easy now a lot of times you'll get this clogged up this is this is a little bit clogged so what I do because I'm basically cheap I move this over just the thickness now I can go around in a radius it doesn't matter because I'm really only using the edge now I've got myself a new cutting edge again I'm working the middle of the fillet first I'm not going to go out onto the silver until I get this center. And you can see it's just powdering right off. It's just totally powdering off. Not a whole lot different than if you were sanding like maybe eight or nine pound balsa wood. Now, once I'm, yeah, there's one spot up here I'm not real happy with. Now I want to go out onto this just a little bit. Well, I see some sanding scratches in the silver. I don't want to... Now, of course, if you're going over raw balsa wood, you got to just assume you'll get that blend. It'll be soft when you're done blending it. Again, just to use a different edge, now I'm working on a different edge. See, a lot of people spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and they just never, it, it gets worse as you work on it longer and longer. You only want to get this to the point where you, ha where you can not feel the edge of the aeropoxy. Now one of the characteristics of aeropoxy light that it has over any other material I've used is it, fe they call it feather edging in the industry. It feather edges down to where you can't feel where it ends and the balsa wood begins. Now, now you have to watch that you're tempted not to start cutting a ditch in there. I don't want to go through. 
I'd rather build this up with a little bit of primer. I want to do the same thing on the balsa wood. Just work my way down. This balsa wood already has a coat of fiberglass on it, so it's a little harder. And by the way, it's always better to go over wood that has a finish already on it than raw wood. I just find it easier to get the blends that way. By the way, an interesting story a lot of people don't understand. And of course, it doesn't really apply to control line stunt. I just find it to be an interesting story about fillets. In the development of the P-38, they had a terrible, terrible problem with vibration and shuddering in flight and in dives that really was almost, almost terminal to the design. And what they found out is by putting bigger and bigger fillets in around the wing, cured the whole problem. So it could be that even in our event, it could be that they serve some, and, and probably a real aircraft engineer, probably Paul Walker would, would know that right off the top of his head or whatever, but plus in our case, this is going to add some strength. We're just, I would not want to make a take apart plane with no filleting on a, on a plane that's in one piece, I would risk it, but not on this. Not on this type of construction. And by the way, I've thought long and hard about how I'm going to reinforce this front. I, it's the next thing on my list. I just haven't really gotten comfortable with how. I want to wind up with three bolts in the front instead of two. I thought about those two bolts, and I kept thinking one gets loose, and ooh, makes me nervous. Anyway, that fillet's done. That's how much time I would be willing to spend. Now, I'll spend a little time when we bolt these together to true these up. But that's basically ready for the, the coat of primer. It shouldn't take any longer than that. Okay, now you notice with Rodak primer, and I want to put this on the tape because this is a key thing a lot of people don't realize yet. A lot of the filler, the fillers that are in here, and this is a very high grade aircraft quality primer. So you want to spend, again, some reasonable amount of time stirring it because I make my concoction for brushing. Now the retarder makes it makes it take about five times longer to dry than if you use thinner, but you get a tremendous advantage in the adhesion. Anytime a product takes longer to dry, you usually get more penetration and a better chemical bonding. Now if you were to just take the material off the top and leave all the filler down the bottom, well, it would kind of defeat some of the purpose of using this material. And to to have a material that th that's this high quality and then defeat the whole purpose of it by using either the wrong thinner or or some combination of not stirring it or whatever. All right, once that's stirred up, now I want to carefully measure off half retarder, half Brodac primer for that first coat. One thing, if you put more than the amount, more than 50-50 retarder, it won't hurt, you'll just need more coats, and you're always better with those first coats thin. Now to this I'm going to add a couple of drops of fish eye killer, because my hands you can tell from working in a machine shop are contaminated, and unless you have perfectly immaculate shop conditions, I like to add fish eye killer to every blend. One or two drops to every, every little amount of dope, whether it's a big amount or a small amount. And because I'm going to sand this off, it won't really matter. And while this is drying, another thing, if you're doing a take-apart plane, while one side is drying, you can be sanding the other side, so... And what you'd like to do, if possible, is get a brush load of primer. And in one stroke, without having to ever go back, See, I didn't have enough on here, but if I did have a little bit bigger brush, now obviously what I want to do is let that dry, let it get a little bit of a tooth. Doesn't matter that it's uneven, we're going to sand it out anyway. If you can get it on in one, hey, there's no reason you couldn't just spray this on either, but in this case, really not mandatory. 
Now this is going to take a little bit longer than a mix with thinner would take to dry. Uh, see, I didn't have enough under. I really need a little bit bigger brush for this length of a fillet. But while this is drying, one of the things I can do, I can work on the other half. I think you can see how that's getting a good penetration and a long dry time. Really good idea that I always do in the shop because we have hundreds of jars of paint. Is mark what's on it. And I like to put on the date. Because what's going to, well, I keep thinking it's 99. What will happen is eventually we'll want to know what date that is. And this is just a good idea. Put this aside just like this. And I know, well, I'm going to use it later today, but I know in the future, look at this, I'm leaking all over myself. In the future I'll know when I, when I mix this and exactly what's in here. The other half of our fuselage is no different. And it gives us, oh, an hour or so we'll work on this. True this all up. And then this can be drying. And while this is drying, we can work on the next, you know, the next phase. I always try to plan something, especially with something like this. So one thing is drying and I'm working on something else. Because a lot of times you get to a day, you put the first coat of clear on a plane at 9 o'clock in the morning and the rest of the day you have to wait. Well, if you plan your work schedule out, especially with fillets, I know this typically has to dry. One day is fine, two days is better. But, but I had plenty of other shop projects to work on while this was drying. Well, if I didn't, I'd put this on 9 o'clock in the morning. Bingo. Now, first thing, of course, let's get a new piece of sandpaper. Take a dedicated little area here. I want to be real careful because this is a thin area here. Just carefully work my way out onto that very thin area. Now, the better, I'm trying to get this on a close up. You can see, see the seat? The little shiny spots. When you know you have little shiny spots, you know you still need to do a little sanding. You'd like the whole area to be dull. Then you know you should if you're using a polywog or a, a sanding block of some kind. Should be relatively smooth. Now because we're still, we've been using Aeropoxy Light for two years already, and we still have not, have not bottomed out on finding other uses for it, there's a million other things to do with it. And I just, ha I know it's real helpful in making molds. We've used it a lot in mold making. But filleting seems to be the number one thing. And obviously a tail fillet, a cowl fillet, the fillet around here, it would all be relatively the same. And we're going to try to include all of the footage that we have onto a real dedicated Aeropoxy Light video. Because a lot of people are new to using this, this kind of a material. And you can see now there's no shiny spots. The blend is perfect. A good example of a spot. We're done sanding up to here. Here's a spot where it's a little bit rough here still. So I know when I laid that in, I probably hit that with the prop blade or the marble or something just a little bit less accurately than I'd like. So as I start to do the sanding, you're going to see some high spots. Whoops. See the high spots come right through? Now you know those little canyons. I want to be real careful now because I know I'm near a spot that's not dimensionally correct when I sand this out. So now I want to also, while I'm doing that, make sure that and I, using your finger is the best gauge of all. See, I've already, I've already got the high spots out. Now I can just run right down the fillet and out to the edge. And it looks like we've got that kind of blended in now a little bit. 
And of course, we'll just work our way up onto the fillet, up onto the other part. Doesn't matter. Now, if you did the whole area at once, and I'm just trying to show two different techniques, and I've used both of them, of doing relatively the thickness of the, the sanding block, or if you work the whole fillet area at once. As long as you know, you can't leave any shiny spots on there. When you're finished, there can't be any shiny spots. And again, get some idea of, say you're doing an RC plane with a big giant fillet. Well, you might want to put it on in two or three layers. Use different radii. When this material hardens and it really it really becomes a very formable material. Easy to sand. The Brodac primer adheres to it like, like a bond you can't believe. And I've even used other finishing materials right on top of it and even on that little yellow cardinal and not had the fillets go bad in any way at all. Gonna be a little bit of a difficult area here. I purposely I had some little rough spots that I haven't sanded out here. So what I'll do is I'll sand them first and then work my way right into the fillet. In other words, if you follow this action, you're going along and then up on the fillet. Once you get that radius half the way you'd like it, then you can go right off. And you want to wind up now. See, there's still a little shiny area in there, so I want to really be careful. What probably is happening is I don't have the right radius in the hard part of this. And of course, the last thing we'll do is bolt the two pieces back together and then fare this in. I can't really get that shape until I have the two pieces butted together. Now, even filling in a little bad spot in the fuselage where I had a little fingerprint or some chunk. I know there's one up here, too. Right up here. The only problem, the reason I haven't fixed it is what's where we're going to put the scoop. But... If we did get a chunk, a little piece missing, a place where you want to fare things right up right up in the front like that, it's no problem at all. Sides of this really sand it out nicely. And I don't know how you can if you can see that it really is the material just powders right off. You always want to check before you're done, and this is one of the things I guess would be appropriate to put on the tape. One of the things I always want to make sure is that I don't have a little bit of a ditch around the edge. So I'll take a sanding, of a smooth sanding block, and just dress that edge off just a little bit. Of course, whatever I miss here, it won't matter. The Brodac primer will pick it up right away. Anyway, having these fillets sand out real nice. Now, the next step is, is really a big advantage. Next step I'm going to do is put the other, the other half, the wing in place, bolt it all up together, and then work on getting this, this joint real nice up in the front. Now, you can see I purposely made this a little bit bigger in radius than I needed because I wanted to be able to bolt this all together and be able to sand both of them at the same time. And being able to sand them both at the same time rather than do one and try to match it just makes it a whole lot easier to do it this way. Things here is that make sure, at least I want to make sure, I don't get too aggressive and sand a ditch into the fuselage. And I'll just do this nice and slowly. I'm always tempted to just be real aggressive here, but I want to get the blend right into the leading edge. And for sure, you want it to be oversized right from the beginning. 
That's one of the parts you always see at a parents judge when they pick up the hand and can feel right in there. So I'm trying to keep the sandpaper off the fuselage side and, and yet get the, the blend right out onto the wing. The hardest for me to get, the hardest part of a fillet is to get where this just blends right in here. And what I did, I sanded right through a little further than I wanted to. So what I did, I just laid in some hot stuff, let it kick normally, and I can build that little edge up this way, even if I have to do it in two or three layers. I want to be sure that I leave this relatively rough, not perfectly smooth. And you might be thinking, well, well, wouldn't it be a good idea to leave the balsa wood rough too? Well, not really, because balsa wood is made up of cells that have plenty of room in between the cells for material to get a good bond. So you really don't want to leave rough balsa, but on composite, the cells are very, the cells, the molecules are very close together. Now it's my understanding, and I'm certainly not the, uh, the world's record holder on this, but that 80 grit paper is the material of choice, except I've found, and this is 240 again, 240 seems to give me a relatively good grip, and 80 is just a little rough around balsa wood if you happen to run over and touch the balsa wood. Anyway, we repaired that little area up here where I dinged this. Just put a couple layers of thin CA and block sand it out. And again, the last thing, I want to get one of these that has a real flat to get right up so I have a blend. And what I'm trying to do is get a blend here. It used to be years ago with the Nats, they would really look over the fillets and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the last four concourse winners don't have fillets, so <laughs> I don't know, maybe they forgot to look. But I just can't picture how you could do this with a take apart and not have a, well, Maybe there is a way. We haven't gotten to that point yet on the carbon body. Now we're ready for the primer. I think that worked out just about, geez, about as nice as I could expect. And the last thing, we'll put on a coat of Brodac primer. And I'll probably put two or three coats on in the course of the day, but while I'm working on other projects, but I want to make sure each coat goes on. Now, this brush is just not big enough. You really need a bigger brush. And yeah, with retard, you have plenty of time if you want to go back and forth over it like this. It's really not a problem. But as you build coats up on a second or third coat, you want to try to get it on all at once. Or just spray it. You could back mask a little bit here and just airbrush these in if you wanted to. And as we lay the second and third coat on here, boy, it really starts to look nice. Anyway, we'll put this aside to dry. While this is drying, I want to think about how I want to reinforce that former and get an extra bolt in the nose and that nose former. Okay, we're about finished. This is going to have to dry up. Now again, one of the things you could think about doing is letting this dry overnight, but we have about another hour left in our little building session. And I really don't like the sand primer before it's dry overnight. But I'll wait till the very last second, just before I quit for the day, and then just brush on one more coat. And tomorrow it'll be ready to sand. And it'll have that, that quality. When it dries overnight, especially if it's up by a heating vent, it tends to, in the morning, just powder right off. Even though that's true, you could sand it right now. Remember, that retarder 
slows down the drying process and that's one of the things that if we were using regular thinner well I'm not so sure that I'm not going to start on the first couple of coats of dope that I put on the raw wood I'm going to start mixing up a blend of 50 50 retarder and, and we're going to try that before this project is over with let me work on that bulkhead now now I know Cassie's plane shows two screws and I'm kind of, I don't know, I get nervous about two screws. And I've thought of, I'm trying to think of a, some unique way of doing it, but I think just adding a third screw in the tank box is going to be the answer and the easiest way out on this. Sure, how Paul Walker gets those uh, in, probably exactly the same. Or if he has three screws, five screws, or what in his. But we certainly, uh, see this would be a point in time where if I could look at how his plane came apart or a lot of the other guys that maybe some of the Europeans I know Fitzgerald's plane the tail comes off but these these things when you have to invent them along the way it, well not invent them but you have to kind of think how you want to do it I just feel like two screws in a nose is I don't know just not enough Step is I have to see see what I want to do is triangulate this I want to see how close up into this corner the tank box I can get a bolt. The bigger of a footprint I can make, the bigger of a triangle, of course, the better it'll be. I have a real long drill. I don't know even what we use this for at the machine shop, but I got one of these to drill a pilot hole to see where, I, and of course, I need to be able to get in there with a wrench. I got the third hole drilled in, and I've got plenty of room inside the tank box to get at that screw. In fact, I can get a super long Allen wrench when I need to get at that. Obviously, it's going to require taking the motor and tank out when you want to take the wing out, but I think I just, I know I'm going to sleep better without having to worry about that. Should have done this right from the beginning, but hey, this is the learning curve. You're always at the bottom when you start. It's going to be to make an accurate template of this bulkhead, similar to this bulkhead, so I can lay out how I'm going to make the joint in the other bulkhead. a real basic old-fashioned way to make a pattern just let the pencil do the impression crude but it'll work we're gonna need this obviously so we can drill the bulkhead on the other on the carbon you know th these are the little things as you go along you, know, you wish you could learn this in the beginning but obviously you can't okay so now we have a pattern of what these holes are gonna look like Now I want to make this piece up out of a piece of plywood and make sure it bolts right to the back there. Now because all of the torque reaction is going to be in this dimension, I want the grain going the most amount of the grain that I can get in this dimension. But I can just drill the holes first, see that I have a good alignment before I make up a part. And this I don't even need the whole I can figure this out after. Okay, now this gives me an align. This is actually an alignment jig right now. So I can use this to line up my bulkhead. Now I just can figure out the shape. And I'll mark this, obviously, so it can go into the, uh, the plan. Marking this up so that I know this is not a, not a former. This is just the bolt hole alignments. Right, so now I know I can put the two bolts in here and then I can figure out what the shape of my bulkhead is going to be. Believe me, the second model we make will be so much quicker. <laughs> but hey, this is how you learn. Now by holding this in place, what this is telling me is where that hole is on the fuselage. So that I can use this, I'm only using this for a pattern to do my alignment, that's all. And this will hold this in place. And this will lay out the, the, I guess it's gonna be triangle shaped, I'm looking at it. It's roughed out what my extension to that bulkhead is going to be. 
on multiple layers of 60 foot plywood because I want all the grains going in this direction. I think the wood will give me a better bond because I'm gluing into wood than if I have to use carbon fiber here. Just be a better use for the wood. Okay, with the part finaled, finalized, now I need to get a notch cut in the front of that wing so this can sink in and epoxy this in place. And what I'll do is I'll have the last screw hold it in position while the glue is setting. I use some slow setting glue. Mixture in place. I can measure back just how much of this I need to remove because I want that to slide down in there. I want to get plenty of a glue footprint on this. What I'm trying to do here is little by little just take this material out. I got all that material out of there and I made a little tongue and groove joint on the piece that's going to go in there. I just need to do a final fitting now. It's a little oversized and you can see I put a little tongue on it. Because what I want to be able to do, I want both pieces flush and this will take up for the fact I'm, I'm going right behind the carbon. I have the glue down in there I have the tongue going right down into the carbon and this should and a little piece of Teflon sheet in between so any of the glue that oozes out I don't wind up gluing this plate to the front and having to rip it apart so our little alignment jig is just going to hold that in while the glue dries and then we'll do a little quick fit to see if it's a nice tight fit in the fuselage So, now, Karen says I should be on a diet. I'm gaining too much weight. So look what she brings me down for supper. A nice salami sandwich and diet soda. So I don't get In today's mail, we get uh, from our friend Ken Clapson. <laughs> Shady. I wonder who Shady is. Anyway, look at this. He's got pro stunt headquarters. He knows I'm out shoveling snow. Well, he's up there in Alberta sunning himself like a lizard on a rock. Anyway, making fun of me locking myself in the garage. Anyway, just because I put a cell phone in the garage from now on. Anyway, Ken, I'm going to pass this to Stunt News, but I don't know if they're going to publish it. Don't have your feelings hurt if Tom doesn't publish it. Now, this came in today, and this is from Mike to Fano. And Mike's saying they're going to try to get a... Uh, a meet going this year out at the Suffolk field and of course that's the field where if you've never seen the video of Vic Macaluso towing a tree you gotta watch that 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 is some of the best video ever shot anyways Mike Chioda some of the other some of the lucky is Rudy some of the other guys out at the field look like they got quite a crew going there and uh, we hope they have some good luck with their meet any questions, call Mike. Now, of course, what we need to do today, this is all dried up now. Pull off the template and see if it fits in the fuselage, which will always be a thrill if it doesn't. And if it doesn't, we'll have to go with plan B. Anyway, this, the little Teflon paper, Teflon sheet, I don't know what the right term of that is. But having this little template is going to help us when we go to do that carbon fiber body because we can use this for our reference point. Go we'll see if it fits. Moment of truth. Believe me, this is one of the true miracles <laughs> lined right up. I had to make this crazy Allen wrench with a big piece on the end. But, now, I thought of two things. Once I've once I fly the plane a few times, I can take this screw out and see if it affects it in any way, if it vibrates or if it's... Look how nice that pulls out. And if I don't need it, after the next year I'll, I'll do the CAS thing with two, but I'm still nervous. I'm a three-bolt guy. In fact, I wish I could get four bolts in there. So this all lines up. I want to fill this hole in here with some, I don't know, I guess some epoxy or something. 
make sure I have a good joint there and put a little fillet in the back of this. And the last thing I did, I built that little fillet up with epoxy in the back, brushed on one coat of Brodac primer, and we'll let this dry before we come back and try to detail it out. I have to admit, I was lucky in being able to make it fit. <laughs> because if it didn't fit, oh! Anyway, we lucked out for once. Oh, I got a really nice letter today from, look at this epoxy. Look at how they package it. Oh, it's not epoxy, it's honey. This is a friend of mine. Al Yankowski. Now, he's a beekeeper. So I was thinking this would be a great thing to do to somebody. He sent me this honey. My wife will... Hey, by the way, Al, thank you very much, and my wife will definitely use it. Here's his address. If you want some mail-order honey, you just can... The gentleman is building some profile cardinals right now. with, And he's one of our first customers for George Venturini's aluminum landing gear. Now, I was just thinking how cool this would be is you take this jar when it's empty and I'll fill it with epoxy <laughs> and, and somebody will come along and say, oh, part A, honey. No, hey, thank you very much. My, we will be enjoying this in the near future. A, by the way, this is the first time I've, I've gotten cookies from Oscar Vans. I've gotten endless little tokens of uh, thanks from people, but this is the first time I believe I've ever gotten honey. Okay, and today's mail, too, from Paul Winter. And this is his Tsunami. And, boy, it looks like it's coming along real nice. Now, Paul, don't take any shortcuts. Now, the last time I, uh, I spoke to Paul, of course, he was hot to trot for more Reno Air Racers, as, as I am, too. Anyway, this is his plane in silver. I'm going to read right off the note. Just before the color scheme is applied... By the way, Paul, you could use one of those carbon cockpits. I can get one out of the mold for you this week. You know, here's my, here's my critique, Paul. And I know this is going to break your heart, but you did what Kent Tyser did, is you made this just come down. There's a lip there. There's a lip that comes out and then goes out. And I know, I know on future models you'll have that choice... Same thing here. If you have that little lip, and that's why I took all the time making that. By the way, it looks like his take apart features, and well, he's going to have fillets. I'm not going to have fillets on my plane. Similar. Now I see another thing. See, this is what you learn from pictures. See, he makes his parting line a little bit in front of the wing. Well, we could do that too. What it does, it just makes making the fillet a lot easier. Okay, after doing some of the lettering. By the way, this looks real nice, Paul. I hear he's shading in the canopy with black edging. That's nice. I like the way this comes apart. Now, see, these are the things, because I'm doing them, too. I'm noticing all the little things, like how the fillets break apart and things like that. So I really appreciate these. Nice little look at the lettering here. Wanted to make some semi-scale wheels, and so he cut his own wheels up. This looks pretty good. He made them out of bar stock. Pretty cool. Now, I didn't even think about that as one of the choices, but obviously we have a lathe. And by the way, this is what they look like when they're finished. Well, I'd say you did a good job. Now, I've heard through the grapevine, John Benzig turned these down. They did, John did the whole job. Anyway, another interesting thing, and we've seen this before. This is Roy Cherry's model. The reason he's doing this is he wants to leave the pipe and everything in place and just be able to take the wing out through the top. Now, after what I just went through with all these extra bolts in the front, this this kind of scares me. Not saying it's not going to work, but it scares me that I don't know. I just like to have more rigidity up in that. And although this is probably just trying to think of other ways of doing things. This is certainly. I'll be interested to see how the motor runs with this setup. Here's the thing with the with the wing out. And boy, I'll tell you, I I couldn't sleep at night knowing there's only two 440 bolts up there. But apparently, and see, this is when I'm I'm basically the new guy in a block when it comes to this. His little hatches and things are coming. But it's still two bolts. I don't know. It. I saw it on Kazzy's plans, and I just said, uh-oh. I don't know if that's enough. Sent me a couple of big copies of one of my favorite pictures of the Spitfire flying. 
that I really, the flaps are deflected and everything. Paul, and thanks a lot, I appreciate it a whole lot. Past week or so, and I've been doing it all off camera, I've made up a whole other set of shells. Our friend Elliot Scott from England is going to be building one of these planes, and I want to, in the week when he's here, I want to have some of these shells ready for him. Laid up another crutch for him, and we'll be pulling all this apart within 48 hours. I found out two really important things here. I tried the techniques that Bud McKnight basically uh, passed on to me, and they've worked very well. The other thing is I've been curing these at a much lower pressure, and each time I make one, I try to lower the pressure just a little bit, just to see, you know, if it's practical to do that. Here I am, I'm just curing up one of, one of the last parts for Elliot, but see, this is the thing, I'm sure a year from now, two years from now, or somebody that does this for a long time. By the way, what's real nice now is Ed Gallagher's back, giving us tips and tricks and ideas, so this one is curing. By the end of the week, we'll have a whole nother set of shells for Elliot. Doing little by little every day that the mold is available, or I have some little extra resin left over. I've been making these parts up with the extra resin, just so I had a lot of a lot of choices. We're going to be using these in different areas. I made them up thicker and thinner, bigger and smaller. There's this mold release on there. And what I want to do is, from this selection of scoops, I want to try laying out that nose scoop and sinking it in. That's about the only thing I'll have time left today to do. But rather than just start with one, and I thought the big one would be great down by the pipe or whatever, and the small, I even made another one that I have three of these now. But I think the smaller of these is going to be the most appropriate. Part of any, any of these composite parts, the first step is to take, and I've been using the old Bud McKnight sanding sticks, I want to roughen this up so that the paint will stick. Now Ed Gallagher, when he sent me, and boy he was so much help years ago, it was unbelievable, he sent me a couple of good ideas for installing the bulkheads, and I think we're going to be using them. As always, that's what I love about this hobby, is people that, that doesn't need a lot of work. I just want to have a, a beginning scuff on this because I'm going to have to cut it and trim it, of course. But you sure don't want to go over anything that's bright and shiny. The first step on this is going to be to get the location, and because we can't make it scale, we really just can't make it scale. I'm going to have to see where this looks about the most appropriate. And because it's the smaller of the scoops, I'll cut this first, see how I like it. And if I don't like it, obviously I can make it, I can use any of the two bigger sizes also. I can, in my, in my little experiments here, believe me, it's really annoying me that we haven't got the glue yet. I, I realize not only do you need sanding, you also, I've been taking M600 and cleaning the part totally flushing it to get all the sanding debris off also. Once I get this laid out, and I'm not so sure I'm real happy with this yet, what I'll do of course is put a center line down a fuselage with tape, lay the outline of this out with tape before I do any cutting at all, just to make sure I'm, I'm satisfied with where it is. And I'm, I'm just looking, this probably needs to be to be, it can't be scale, it has to be in proportion. When I'm doing anything like this, what I like to do is just try to lay out a center line to work with. Tape is a very convenient way of doing this. Now I can just roughly position this, get some idea where I want to make the first cut. Now with this piece laid out, now what I can do is make a little pattern. I'll make a pattern out of paper of what that that hole is going to look like. I don't want to just trace the part. I want to make a, a pattern that this slips through. Now using that pattern I can just roughly, what I can do is bang into the camera if I want, just roughly get this cut. 
I'll make it undersized, of course, at first. And little by little, open it up. This is oversized by far. This just gives me a rough, I guess, the roughest of outlines. Undersized in every dimension. And now I can go get a brand new, brand new blade. Try to cut this on a 90 degree angle. We're going through glass and a molded shell. Now I've found this kind of stuff, there's no substitute for just making the part undersize. Oh man, I don't believe this. President Nixon, back in the grave. Cool, looks like somebody threw a dagger at the plane. Anyway, President Nixon is alive and well. He just wants you to know, vote Republican in the, uh, the primary. Okay, we got to get this part out of here. Now, if we're really cool, it won't fall into the fuselage, and I'll have to go get it out with a fish hook or something. Well, the tape comes up anyway. It's like a little snow shovel. But that's all I can think about is snow shovels here. What I'm trying to do is just dress this off just enough because I would like to have a relatively tight fit. After a rough fitting, I can see I just need to take some of this material off ahead of time. Oh man, it's fun, believe it. President Kennedy calling sunk in there. I ran a little bit of thin CA on each side just to hold it in place because now I'm going to have to real carefully sand, grind, or cut somehow, get the extra material off on the front. Now I know there's quite a bit of material to take off here, so what I'm going to do is just basically Take it off with a sanding block, nice and slow, not try to be too aggressive. Get the blend in there. It's just gonna take, just take time to get that nice and flush. Got that edge nice and smooth, and of course I gotta get a blend, so this blends right in here. Get all the edges trued up, and I wanna make a little piece for the back here. By the way, when you flip this over, this worked out pretty well. I think that's going to look relatively close to what it should look like. Now right, I got to make that upper edge. Turns into Strega overnight. <laughs> Let's see how you're going to take this apart now. Rich has got his uh, pipe removal tunnel here, or whatever this is. I'm not sure I know what this is. This is a cow. Okay, you made them 256. That's okay. There's no strain there. Just you don't want to do anything with one screw, and one screw comes out and the whole bottom block flies out and hits oh, Gary no. McClellan in the head or something. You know, no, you don't this, want. This is not going to come out. I, I see you got four up in the cowling here. And I have one in the back. Yeah, that's believe me. The way that that's if the plane doesn't fly because of one extra screw, well, that's a, not not a good design. That means Wendy didn't design it. Is this a uh, four forward? Pretty good. So all we got to do is lay out the stinger for the tune pipe now, and yep. we could get rid of you tonight. I like the way that comes apart. That's going to be nice. I hope. How did you do? What did you do? Just make a joint there? Yeah, this was a this, this was a block. We're going to fiberglass over everything yeah. now. So this whole yeah. thing is going to be fiberglass. Yeah, this is a joint. Okay. This yeah, but it, once it's fiber, now yeah, it's be before fine. you fiberglass this, though, you got to super sand this smooth. Yes. That's got to be perfect. All these edges have to be perfect, because once it's glass, you don't want to have to do that. You don't that. want to touch it anymore. Yeah, this is nice how you did this. I like this little... That's good. Now, what I'm thinking of doing is, because the fuselage here bends a little, Okay. put some plywood here. Yeah, you could do that. this prevents it from bending. Sixty-fourth plywood yeah, is right. good. A couple, pieces. couple of pieces here. Now, I'll show you what you really want to do. You want to put, lay this down here. You want to put sixty-fourth plywood, a whole piece, glue this right to, to the table. Okay. Then cut this out and leave a cut a quarter inch lip around the whole thing. 
so that you have a lip running right down the edge here. When you say glue it to the table, you mean? Glue it to the plywood. Oh, glue it, oh yeah. In other words, take a sheet of plywood right, and glue the whole plywood down there. Then when you're done, of course it cuts with a scissors, cut the outside out, a little bit oversized, and then inside, you know, you can cut the inside ahead of time if you right, want to right. make it easy. Okay, but leave a quarter inch lip, because that keeps it from doing this, oh, Okay. and it makes it nice and solid. It's a good way, you should do that on a so whole block. And in, it'll come out like this. Right. Right, okay. Do the whole block. You don't. Have, it doesn't matter even if you have joints in it. It doesn't okay. matter. You could use strips. Right. Right. However I you want to do it. Right. But but that's this a nice way, way. Make it at least a quarter of an inch. Now anything that hits the pipe, you grind away. Right. Well, it, I tell you, I have plenty of room here. Oh, you got room closed. Now all I got to do is finish that pipe, put the stinger on it. But this has got to be cut down, doesn't it? Because I measured dimensions you have now. Oh, I see what you're saying. You plug that and put the, the yeah, stinger here? Yeah, yeah. You don't want to make the pipe where it's real, you know. I want to have the stinger in the middle here. Right, yeah. Okay, and we'll trim it right even with this. Right even. Right. So you, and I'll just put a cap on the back. All right. You don't That'll make it, it quieter. No, no, it'll make it quieter, too. Okay. This way, they'll all be the same. If you want to use one of my pipes oh, that's fine. That's with fine. the stinger on the bottom, you right. can switch it okay. right in there. It'll be no problem. Yeah, that'll work out okay, Rich. That now, looks pretty I, decent. I tried putting a... Uh, bad thing is, and this is, I'm, I'm trying to make this piece that would be the little lid, and I broke right through the piece underneath, so what I'm going to have to do, there's really no reasonable way to replace this, that's a problem, I can't get in from underneath, so what I'm going to do is just cut this out, luckily I have other pieces, these, and I'm glad I have some extra pieces to work with, see what happened, this is so thin, so what happens when you go to sand inside, you got to be real careful in that corner. It's real easy to crack that corner, and that's what I didn't want to have happen. And obviously it happened, so maybe what I need to do is on the next piece lay an extra little piece of cloth along here. Or even better, I'll just make them. I've been making these four layers thick. I'll make them five layers thick. They don't weigh anything anyway. A lot of people, and I mean they, they hesitate when they see something's going to be, see that's going to be a problem there. There and I thought of how I can fix it with a glue joint. Get in front. The easiest way sometimes is just to punt the football, rip it out, and do it over. It's not a big deal to cut it out. It is the problem right there. As I got this way too thin. So this is one of the ones I had made with three layers, all oh, four layers, whatever. I'm gonna I'm gonna use the strongest one. See, I didn't. I never realized this is gonna be such a problem to have this so thin. But that's part of the learning curve, and I'm never, I'm never, uh, you know, afraid to just rip it out. I'm just ripping that out. Now, of course, we'll have the same outline, but now we have a pattern we can match, so the second piece will go in a little better. I also noticed, and this was something I didn't notice before, in some of the photos of Miss Ashley, have, that this lip is very thin up here. I thought this, this had a hole in here. It doesn't. It's like a, a whole scoop that goes right in, so that'll save us making one bulkhead, too. Having a piece that's a pattern, to me, this will be a big help. See, I can kind of lay that out in my mind before I even cut the piece. But what I didn't, in other words, from looking at the pictures, when you look from some of them, it looks like there's a hole in there. But when I looked at some of the other ones, from, a, from other angles, you could see right in there. So, so actually, this piece doesn't even belong in here. I would have just remove that anyway trick I learned, of course I'm learning this as I go, is to insert the piece from behind. Just makes lining it up a lot easier. I need to trim a little bit here. Yeah, unless you have a real good photograph to work with. Some of these things that look real simple. Now, we're finding out all the little things that you can do wrong here, so I hope eventually I'm going to be real happy with the way this looks. This is one of the focal points. And I don't care if I have to spend a couple days on this. I'd like this to really look like the prototype. Now I've been trying to get, as I have this tacked in here, see one side is higher than the other here by about a 30 seconds. So I'll break the high side, take a little material off of there. Because if, if this is crooked, even just a little bit, boy, you'll notice it. Of course, I've taken this part in and out a few times. I had to make up some thin balls of shims. And what I was real conscious of is keeping these two sides parallel. It's real easy to get them so that, that when you look from the front, that the thing looks like the Lincoln Tunnel after an atomic bomb. 
Anyway, I was careful, shim one side, shim the other side, try to get it as straight as I can. I need to work on this lip, and I'll try to get some kind of reinforcement in there, maybe a piece of plywood or carbon, and then trim this all off and get this seam nice. Of course, the next step is to block sand this off real carefully. Since we've done it already on video, we can just skip over that step. Block sand it all in, and I want to make that lip. As I start to get it, sand it in. Of course, I keep the edge as hard as possible. Now, you, you may be thinking, well, gee, why don't you just be a snap to just carve this in? You know what? Try carving a shape like this, and the problem that you have, no matter how careful you are, how accurate you are, these edges, as soon as you touch that or put a fingernail in there, a piece of sandpaper edge, you know, what, what we've bought by doing this is we have edges. Those edges are not going to deteriorate in time. And with my friends picking up the plane, I'm sure they'll use that to put their fingers in there when they pick the plane up. I made up this little piece. Now I've got to CA this in and then trim this off so that it's nice and even. This will give me a hard edge. Remember, the problem with all these kind of scoops, if you've ever made this really beautiful scoop, like the scoop on the side of Stragon, somebody puts their finger in there, you only get one shot and you can never get it back into shape. So. Having these hard edges, and by the way, the other nice thing is, of course, when we go to do the carbon fuselage, we already will have an exact same shape. Now, a handy way to get this sanded with a little machinist ruler with some sticky back paper. Again, what really defines a plane, I remember Bill Simons gave me a really big compliment one day. We were looking at a plane, a new plane of mine. He's, he said, wow, Wendy, you know what I like about your plane? And I was thinking, oh boy, here it comes. He says, all the little details. You never skip the little details. Well, this is one of them. It took us a lot longer to make this than I really thought it, it was going to, but now I can make as many of these as I want, and I could replicate them very quickly because I have those little molds. And I think the bottom line is that it really does look, once I get some primer on this, we can get a look at the final shape. I think it really does look relatively uh, close to being scale. The last thing, of course, is before we put the primer on, hit any of the high spots. Now you can start to see the final shape. And any little imperfections that still have to be filled in. Believe me, it would be really difficult to replicate this in wood without running into that high risk thing. Little spot up there I didn't see. The primer brings out all the little bad spots. As long as I had the primer in the gun, put another little light coat on the fillets, a little around the canopy, I can start the feather ridge in any little problem areas I have, we're closing in on this. And even though that seems like a small detail, in the overall picture, that little detail to me is very important. And I think that's going to be just fine. And I'll let that primer dry up, and then we can work on some of the other little things that we have relating to this project really moving along nice now. Now as our fuselage sits up by the heating vent, I'm reminded of just a couple of things. Just, you know, it was only, well, three or four years ago we started in on our little world of molding, adding it to our line of business products. And what's happened over the past, geez, three or four years as we've grown to where a major part of our business is making things that are basically molded custom tuned pipes, crutches, of course landing gear, the biggest one of all, and the molds for all these parts. You know we've reached the point in time and where we basically have been able to learn a lot of the little lessons that go into making little parts like this and most important of all, been able to pass a lot of that information on 
and been able to share it. And I appreciate the people like Milt Graham, Paul Winter, Ken Claps, and everybody that on a regular basis sends me pictures of what they're doing and inspires me to do better things. And boy, you can never run off a semi-scale project without in some way thanking Al Rabe and Frank McMillan, the people at uh, Keith Trossel, Billy Warwich, Paul Walker, everybody that's added to the excitement of this event. And my good friend Joetta Musco, who as a wingman and a partner on this project, we just had 1996 a year, I'll never forget. It just was the best, the best Nats I've ever been to. And the most fun. Now it's really debatable just how much time I'm going to be able to put into the detailing. I would love to. See, if I was only making one fuselage, I could be a lot more intense about it. There's a saying that the intensity of artwork is how you measure it. Well, probably what I'm saying is, though, next year when we lay out the project for next year, if we're only going to be making one fuselage and one set of wings, we probably will do a slam dunk job a lot more involved in what we're doing this because we're splitting our efforts into almost making two or three different airplanes by the time you make all the molds. And I want to thank Paul again for sharing his stuff, Milk Graham, and we're going to be seeing you guys in England. Boy, I hope that tsunami flies good because if, if it doesn't fly good, boy, you're going to be in trouble there, Mr. Paul Winter. And I'm always conscious of the fact, and I never put it in the back of my mind, that the things I've learned from Harold Price, from Big Jim, George Aldrich, from everybody, that I've just been glad that I've been able to learn it, and even more happy that I can pass it on. And I'm so happy that the videos let me do that in a way that just makes being in the hobby a lot more fun than if the only thing you had was magazines. A world of semi-scale stunners is this year, possibly more than any other, is going to be a banner year. The Nats videos will probably be the best ever, especially if I don't take too many pictures of the grass. I'm hoping we're going to have our friends from England over here soon, enjoy another visit with them, and we'll be going to England again this summer, get to fly some of those planes in England, see if those guys know anything I don't know. Probably they do. But one thing nice, we'll be able to share the information. And for me, it's been such a long trip. Jeez. Every time I think about it, I think years ago, could I ever have imagined it would all come to this. So nice to have friends all over the world. So nice to have friends that you're sharing a common interest in and you're able to help each other. And as I'm finishing up this tape, I got another set of plans from Al Rabe. Al's by passed them on to Gerald Champ. Gerald's real excited about building some P-51s. Al's definitely, definitely I can tell he's straining at the bit to build another P-51 and boy I can't wait. I hope he's going to send us some video, some photos, some, well, whatever. There's just, there's never enough video, there's never enough, there's never enough photos. And thanks to everyone that basically has helped me along the road. This is I just can't imagine my life without it, without model aviation, without the friends, without Elliot Scott, without John Brodak, without George Wall, I, just impossible to imagine it. And this is Elliot Scott's part of his fuselage, he's going to be building one of these in England, boy, I can't wait. I hope he'll be able to take some of this back with him, he's due to be here this week. And thanks to Kaz Minato too, Kaz, I gotta tell you something though. Needs more than two bolts. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, I appreciate the fact that you share what you do. And hey, Paul Walker, I know you have carbon fiber mounts in your B-17, your new B-17. I can't wait to see it in stunt news. Anyway, we'll see you on the next tape. We're going to be doing some cool stuff. And we'll see you on the next tape. It was George Eno that told me that years ago.
and it's proven to be true. Hope you've enjoyed the tape, and please, by if you do nothing else, share it. Share the information, and share the love of the hobby. And hope we'll see you at the Brodak meet. Now, one final thing you got to remember, and this is the closing line of the video. Yes, we do make pancakes for the birds every morning. And yes, they're getting as fat as can be. Pretty soon they won't be able to fly. But the days grow short